Sir. Hello, everyone. We have another young Indian as part of the Voice of the Young series. Right now, we have with us Anushka Rati. Let's listen to her. Over to you, Anushka. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much, both sir, for having me. Uh, I'm really glad to be here, and I'm really glad to uh, be able to get an opportunity to share my thoughts with everyone. Um, I have some things in my mind that I want to talk about today, but I'm going to let it be a little bit free-flowing. Uh, I want to talk about my move to the social sector, especially because it was a very defining moment in my personal life as well as my career. And hopefully want to encourage some people who are looking to transition into the social impact space, how it looks like and how the journey has been for me, especially. I think... Uh, one more topic that I want to touch upon is mental health and youths. Uh, I think that's something that's very personally close to my heart and uh, something I want to talk about today. So without further ado, I'm going to talk a little bit about my uh, academic and professional background and how I got into the impact space. Uh, so I completed my engineering from IGTU in 2018. And um, I got started as a product manager with Tata Communications, which is a which is the telecom arm of the Tata Group. And uh, I worked there for a year, and uh, there was something in me that was not clicking. So even though everything on paper was quite perfect, it was a middle management role. It was product management was up and coming as a field. I didn't uh, really feel at place, neither in engineering nor uh, you know, with the firm, uh, even though the firm was really, really good to me. And, you know, I had, I made some great friends there. I just feel, felt something didn't click as such. Uh, so at that point of time, I was very confused because everyone around me, uh, you know, told me what a great position it was to be in. And uh, it was a great job with a great package and everything. And uh, something still inside me didn't seem right. Um, I tried to go back to things that made me happy in my uh, undergraduate uh, time. And I sort of went back to uh, Rotaract, which was a social impact club that I started in college. So I was the founder and president of that. And uh, something sort of kept drawing me back to it. But I think there was a disconnect between what I what my heart wanted and what I thought was logically right at that point of time and so I had to take I wanted to take aptitude tests logical tests to understand which career path would be the best for me even though I knew in my heart that I wanted to move into the social impact space it took me a while uh, to convince my brain that this was the right decision to make um, so after I think six months or so of deliberations I took this decision to quit my job. And at that point of time, uh, I had no idea how to, you know, navigate this space. I didn't come from an educational background that sort of led me to understand how this space looked like. Neither did I have the necessary qualifications at that point of time to see how I could enter this space. Um, the first thing that I started looking at was uh, fellowships because I thought that was, uh, you know, a good bridge between getting a feel of the sector as well as gaining some knowledge to be able to perform well in it. Uh, but somehow that also didn't uh, click well with me because I was in, in that job setup and I wanted to continue doing a job. And after some deliberation and after some figuring out, I was able to start uh, at the Nudge Foundation, which was a nonprofit startup based out of, which is a nonprofit startup based out of Bangalore and they work towards poverty alleviation. And uh, how I went about it was a lot of cold messages and a lot of cold emails just talking passionately from my heart as to why I wanted to be in the sector. And I think something uh, clicked with uh, Mr. Adul, Adul Satija, who is the founder and CEO who I reached out to, who then led me to uh, one of the HR team members at that point of time. And it was just a plain LinkedIn message that led me to the job. Uh, and that sort of helped me realize how, uh, how what a difference talking from your heart can make when you're, uh, 
you know sort of making that uh conversation or making that connection with people and I think something clicked at that point of time and I was able to land that job and there was a thorough interview process and everything and I was able to start as a senior associate in their partnerships and fundraising team uh, which was a very very interesting role I loved the culture of the firm I loved um, how there were a lot of people in the firm who would come from uh, a corporate background but somehow like me felt that disconnect from what they were doing in their lives and there was something in them to do something more meaningful and that created the culture of the organization as such that led to so much intent and so much focus and so much passion in terms of what they were doing and most of them had also taken a financial uh, you know pay cut when they were moving into the sector so it was a very intent focused decision which made the culture of the organization just amazing. I loved my time there. I loved working there. And I learned a lot. Uh, fundraising was a position where in you had to uh, know both sides of the story. So you had to know internally what was happening within the organization, what programs we were running, how they looked like, uh, and as well as the external sort of stakeholders and how they look at things. So it was a great way for me to get introduced to the sector. And uh, it was it was amazing. Like my entire time there was amazing. Um, I was able to work with names such as the Rockefeller Foundation, Tata Trust, organizations I didn't think I would be working with when I when I quit my uh, cushy job. Um, post that, I think once I taken that decision. Uh, I think six months within that COVID happened, which was a very, very tough time for not just uh, uh, for profit organizations, but it was worse for non-profit organizations. And it felt like at that point of time that I had taken a decision from my heart and somehow God was coming in the way and people were telling me that, oh, this is not the right decision to take. But I wanted to stick by it. And uh, at that point, uh, uh, I was looking for a career change uh, and I eventually uh, started looking at impact consulting. Uh, there was still so much to figure out about this space, whether it's public policy, whether it's uh, impact consulting, whether it's working with a nonprofit, whether it's working with government institutions. I think there's so many avenues that you can contribute and there's so many ways that you can also define impact and what that means to you personally. So while initially I had a very broad idea as to uh, what working in impact means, which was working for a non-profit, I think I narrowed it down later to understanding that the different aspects or different ways that you can contribute while still being able to pay justice to your uh, skill set and, you know, what your interest areas are. So I think that's something that I also wanted to bring forth that when people think about working in impact, uh, maybe they might make a decision like me that, okay, you quit everything and you move to a nonprofit. And that's not necessarily uh, what you have to do. There are different avenues and ways that you can go about defining what impact means to you and how you want to contribute to whatever you're doing. And uh, impact consulting at that point seemed like the right decision because I've, I've always been a generalist and uh, I wanted to work in an area where I could still learn a lot more about the sector and consulting sort of gives you the opportunity to do that because you get to work with different stakeholders while also sort of uh, learning about different fields at the same time. So while at Nudge, I was in poverty elevation when I moved to uh, KPMG, which is where I'm working now. I work as an impact strategy consultant with KPMG. Um, you could look at sectors like education, you could look at sectors like healthcare, you could look at climate change. Uh, so anything and everything that you can think of and you can, you could look at working with uh, big organizations like the World Bank, or you could look at working with uh, UNDP or UNICEF or even uh, government organizations or private organizations. So there's a lot that can be done when you are looking to if you're looking to switch into the in, into the space and there's so many avenues to sort of figuring out what that impact means to you, like I said. 
and it's been quite a journey uh, since then. I think there have been a lot of points in between where I questioned my decision, where I was uh, very, very scared, especially when COVID happened, especially when I had uh, almost taken uh, 80 to 90% pay cut when I moved to the nonprofit space. And there was a lot of backlash from my family, from people around me, because you know, a lot of people didn't think it was a wise decision to make. But um, I think I stuck by it even through tough times because it's something that I deeply, deeply wanted to do. And I think a lot of it comes uh, from my family and my value system. And um, especially from my father. And he's, he, I think when I was growing up, he's, always been someone who always talked about giving back, who always talked about doing good and not in a very typical sense. He wasn't a part of the uh, impact space as such, but he was always, he's a very helpful uh, person. And I would always hear stories from people around me that, you know, um, he's helped me in so and so ways. And, you know, he did this for me, he did that for me. And I think while I was growing up, money uh, was never the end goal in a lot of things. It's a very privileged thing to say. I I, I uh, am aware of that. But uh, it was never a goal that I was taught when I was younger that this is something that you should aim for and achieve for. And... Um, in some ways, when I started Rotaract, it was to um, honor his memory, honor um, the value system that he instilled in me and sort of carry it forward in some ways. Uh, unfortunately, I lost him when I was 15. So mm. it was a very personal decision that I uh, made when I shifted to the sector. And it was a way of carrying that forward because... <laughs> I was at my job and I was thinking that uh, in five years time, do I want to be at the same position as, you know, one of the seniors at my company and a very strong straight answer came from me and it said no. And I just knew that I wanted to impact the world in some way. I wanted to help change things. I didn't know how, when, where, what, but I knew that that's something that I wanted to do and I figured my way around it. Um, so I think to everyone um watching and listening if you feel there are uh you know you want to contribute into doing something good there are lots of ways a lot of them don't involve quitting your job uh a lot of it can be uh a charity at your own level or um, um you know Figuring out, like I said, what impact means to you, which is something that I keep coming back to. Uh, but I think all of us at some point should question what is the larger mark that we're leaving behind in terms of the work that we're doing. Um, and it can it can be anything. It can be contributing at the smallest level to, you know, making big decisions like I did. Uh, and I think that's that's super essential. But that's been my journey so far uh, in the impact space. And it's still continuing. I'm still figuring out new things. I'm still learning every day. Uh, but it's it's been an interesting journey, uh, to say the least. Okay. That's great. You said you were also going to talk about mental health. So let's hear that. Yes. Yes. So I think mental health is a, is a social issue that I uh, feel personally connected to and feel deeply connected to. Uh, I sort of started exploring it a little bit with Rotaract. So with Rotaract, um, I started the club in my second year of college and I uh, continued it for three years. I had about 250 members and we carried out various uh, social impact related projects. Um, so you would have things like uh, mm -hmm. blood donation camps, visit to old age homes, and uh, different ideas that we would come up with was essentially an all girls engineering college. And we would have a sort of raffle of ideas of what all we could do with the budget that we had and how we can contribute and other Two interesting projects that I want to talk about. One is related to mental health and one is related to 
uh, sort of worker, a blue collar worker acknowledgement that one day we all uh, decided that uh, we want to do something to honor uh, the kind of work that blue collar workers do in our university. And that included, you know, your sweepers, your cleaners, uh, um, security guards. And we sort of made small cards for them which said thank you and um, we got some donations for them as well and uh, which is a very different and interesting thing for me to for us to do and uh, the second thing that I want to talk about was the mental health uh, uh, sort of initiative that we did in college so what I realized at my time there was uh, at my time at university was that there were a lot of people struggling with mental health, uh, but a lot of them didn't have, hmm. uh, didn't recognize the issues as such, and didn't weren't willing to speak about it as uh, as much. Uh, I struggled with mental health issues myself, and I've sort of been open in talking about it. So uh, it sort of came innately. It was nothing that I. Um, sort of instilled in myself but it just came out innately and I uh, uh, ended up talking to people about it in college or to my friends and somehow there were people who started opening up to me as well when I started talking to them. I think that happens that when you're so vulnerable with someone uh, it so happens that they also feel comfortable enough to open up to you and I realized there were a lot of people uh at one point reaching out to me trying to talk to me trying to you know uh get some resources ask for help and uh while I was addressing this at my personal level on weekends by talking to people helping them guiding them I realized that that was this was not a very sustainable solution to the whole thing and we needed to do something to address it at a larger level so that led me to actually uh cold emailing uh a lot of uh, hospitals including fortis wherein i reached out to the psychiatry department wherein i wanted someone to come from the department and have a professional talk about it instead of me being someone to you know sort of shed light on the issue and i actually got someone um uh to speak on the issue a qualified psychologist who came to our college and uh, it involved her sort of talking about the resources that uh, people can access, uh, shedding light on the different types of issues that exist, um, how we can reach out for help, what are the ways we can go about it, what are the ways to identify whether you are you have, uh, you know, if you're struggling with mental health issues or not. Um, so it led me to also giving a speech wherein I discussed my personal um, sort of run in with mental mm -hmm. health issues and uh, led me to opening up and talking about it, which led to a lot of people then eventually coming up to me even later and sharing that whatever I said helped them in so many ways. It helped them feel seen it helped them feel recognized it helped them feel uh validated in their struggles and uh, since then uh whatever avenue i've gotten uh i've published a few articles on linkedin as well uh with respect to uh, to this and uh, i've i've talked about mental health and uh, i that's why i wanted to talk about it today as well i think it's it's as it's an issue that India struggles with massively. I I don't think we have uh, enough resources to deal with it. There's lack of access. There's lack of uh, financial access to a lot of these things, and um, it's something that needs to be addressed because it's not. It seems to be a very privileged quote unquote issue, but uh what we don't realize it is that, that you know even in villages there are farmers who are struggling with it right there's farmer suicides that are happening so we've 
tend to see it from a particular lens, but we don't realize the impact that it has on the quality of life, especially for young people and uh, what they lose out in not realizing their full potential by, you know, because of suffering through these issues. Uh, I think it's changed a lot since I talked about it. This was back in probably 2016 or 2017 when I first spoke about it. And since then, social media has sort of helped uh, sort of create some sort of awareness. Uh, but I think we still have a long way to go in terms of uh, the shame that comes with it, in terms of the perception issues that come with it, which don't allow people to speak up about it. This is why I wanted to take this platform today to uh, discuss it a little bit, say that there are avenues and resources. Mm -hmm. uh, there are also places which are non-profit run organizations where you can get access to therapy for free as well. Uh, there's, there is help in case you need help. And um, it's, it's good to find ways that work for you in your journey in terms of healing yourself. And uh, yeah, I think it's, it's a less talked about topic that should be talked about more. And especially for youths, uh, which is why I wanted to bring it up today. Okay, thank you so much. Let me ask you, uh, is there any difference between men and women, boys and girls in this mental health issues? Do you think they have difference in magnitude, scope, nature? I mean, I'm ignorant, so I'm just asking <clears throat> to be taught, to be explained to. Uh, what is the dif If there are any differences, are they similar? What's going on? Yeah. I definitely think there is a difference in this is my personal opinion. Uh, but I think with <clears throat> perception issue comes a certain perception in terms of how men are brought up that uh, they need to have some qualities that attribute to them in a specific way, which is strength or which is, you know, not crying or which is not expressing themselves. And I think that comes from sort of a patriarchal setup that comes from some sexist notions that men need to be a certain way, which is not true at all. I think that leads to a lot of men, especially in close circles, not having those avenues to talk about things. So, for example, a lot of my friends that I know, uh, the kind of relationships that I have built in my personal friendships with my female friends and the kind of conversations that I might have with them might actually differ a lot from what my male friends have with their male friends. I see, at least in my uh, opinion, a lack of vulnerability, a lack of uh, openness in talking about things. Uh, more stigma and more shame associated with men reaching out for help than women might have. Uh, and that's why, uh, you know, I think the suicide rates also differ between men and women. I think it's higher for men. Um, and uh, it's, it's, there's definitely a difference. Uh, I, but I think that co comes from those gender perception. It comes from the larger societal uh, stigmatization, sexism, patriarchal notions on how things should be and how they're brought up. So it, it's instilled at a very young age, wherein, you know, you're taught not to cry, you're taught not to express yourself, you're taught not to be a certain way. And I think that leads to a lot of those perceptions being carried forward, wherein men might not seek for help, wherein men might not talk to their friends about it, when men in close circles might not address these things as openly as, you know, women might. And... Uh, I think it's it's clear with the with the numbers that are there. Like I said, I think the suicide rates are much higher for men, uh, and it's sad. It's I think it, but it has to be a combined effort of awareness, but also addressing the gender notions that sort of intersect with mental health as well. So, I think both of them need to be addressed. Uh, together. Okay. All right. Uh, 
just one question. Is there any role of bullying in all of this in school and college or that you are aware yes. of? Yes, I think so. Uh, I think it's gotten much worse for the younger generation now, given uh, access to phones and uh, social media. I think it's become very easy to anonymously target people, very easy to bully people, very easy to uh, remain hidden behind the camera and remain, sorry, hidden behind the screen on the camera and uh, sort of target people. And I think it's much, much worse for the younger generations. And I think uh, with recent cases of so many people, uh, uh, so many youngsters on social media that we see of, uh, you know, uh, suicide cases, which have been a result of bullying, actually. And uh, I think in terms of addressing it, uh, there has to be some sort of value systems development in schools. I think the education system that we have sort of uh, is still lacking an emotional and cognitive sort of development for kids. Um, it needs to have a more holistic view of looking at um, education and learning in general and value systems. Uh, which need to be brought forth. Um, but I think it's definitely related and it's definitely a huge issue. So we're talking about not playground bullying, but cyber bullying. Yes. Yes? Okay. All right. It's completely new to older generation who didn't have cyber in their lives. Now we have cyber yes. bullying, right? So I guess the, it has to come with any new technology, new ways to misuse it. Okay. Yeah. Thank yeah. you so much. Any other thoughts that you want to share? Um, no, I think I just want to say that I am open for a uh, conversation to anyone who wants to reach out, who's looking to move into the social impact space. I think that's something that I, I do, those are the kind those kinds of conversations that I love having. I'm somebody who is very talkative, as you might have noticed in this uh, interview as well. So I love to talk to new people and I'm really glad that I had this opportunity today uh, to talk with you. I hope I made some points which made some sense to some people out there. Okay. And uh, uh, always excited to talk to even younger people uh, to understand, uh, you know, their perception about everything. Okay. Yeah. Well, I learned a lot. Okay, so thank you, Anushka. Let's end it here. And I'll be yes. back with another young person or an expert soon. Bye till then. Bye, everybody.